And Michael Carpenter joins us now. Welcome, it's nice to see you. Thank you, it's good to be here. Is this a project that you had been thinking about for some time, or when you heard about the dorms, Clinton's dorms, and, and the declining enrollment and the possibility of them be, being available, did a light go off in your head? Well, I, there's, there's probably a two-part answer for that. We, we, the property that we own across the street from Clinton Community College that we run our day business on, has a dorm on it. It had three dorms on it actually when we bought it. We kept one of them and took the other two down and we always envisioned that at some point we might do something with our dorm. It's always been something that we thought was viable in that area. When the Clinton Community College dorms became available or we heard that Clinton might be getting out of the housing piece, we it kind of expedited the process a little bit for us and we said, you know, this is something that uh, there certainly is a need for. We certainly think we can fill them and if we can get the agencies involved, we think this is a good idea. So I would tell you that I've been, you know, thinking about this or dreaming about a project like this for a lot of years, but the actual nuts and bolts of this transaction have happened relatively quickly, only in the last three or four months. How much of a need is there for something like this? Well, we, I don't have the actual numbers, and we let the agencies tell you the numbers, but I would tell you that the, the homelessness population in this community, if we talk about homelessness first and then we'll come to addiction and mental health, the homelessness problem here is more than just what most people think of as homeless. The man sleeping on the street or you know living at one of the motels. There are hundreds of people that are sleeping on friends' couches or living in their parents' basement or any of those kinds of things because they can't afford an actual apartment or a home here. They kind of fall into that Alice number of you know people that work but they're kind of the working poor. So we think the problem is pretty profound with regards to homelessness. And if you ask the county the amount of money that they spend on emergency housing is quite astronomical. So they have a need for something that's a little more progressive than just putting people into a hotel room. With regards to ad addiction, and, and if you take addiction and you go beyond the opiate crisis, which is the immediate uh, most talked about piece, addiction in general continues to be on the rise and has been on the rise for years. And what's happening as the addiction crisis continues to grow, homelessness is becoming a bigger part of that addiction crisis. Years ago, many people that were in active addiction could keep a job, could have a home, could do those things. Circumstances warrant that that's not the case anymore. People are falling much quicker, so there's more of a need for this. And then you throw in the mental health piece, which is finally being talked about enough. And as if you talk to any of the mental health clinics, the number of people who are coming in for mental health services is really exploding. It's, it's, it's growing by leaps and bounds. So we kind of put those together and say this was the perfect storm of things uh, that we need to look at. And I, I would tell you, and I'll advance a little bit, this may be a question you have, Part of this is to understand that this isn't just a housing model. This is an actual transitional life skills model so that we can help people with all of the things that contribute to the reason why they're homeless or unemployed or addicted or you have mental health issues. Do they have to be homeless though to, to live here? For, for certain programs that will happen. We, because we are not going to facilitate the actual programs that go on in the facilities, they'll be administered by the organizations in this area. And if I gave you the names of some of those organizations, Behavioral Health Services North, Champlain Valley Family Services, Clinton County Mental Health and Addiction, Evergreen Townhouse Community, Clinton County Social Services, all of those people will rent pieces of the dorm for specific population that will be there. So uh, initially, yes, homelessness may be a part of it. Down the road, there may be a recovery version for people that are not homeless. Maybe they're getting out of treatment. Um, maybe nonviolent and non-sex offenders that are getting out of jail and need a place to live for three months. So there's a lot of programs that are kind of in the works for this. And for the substance abuse, will they actually receive treatment while in this Facility. That's, that is the goal. The, uh, the plan is because we have the dining hall and the dining hall has a nice classroom set up and a lot of available space as well as community rooms. We have pledges from most of the treatment providers in this area to say we want to be involved. We don't know exactly how yet, but we want to do that. Um, if you think about the location, we are within walking distance of Conifer Park, uh, NAMI, and Clinton County Mental Health and Addiction Services. So we have some people right very close by. Uh, we would like it to be a program that has actual services at the facility. And when Senator Schumer was here and he talked about uh, the billions of dollars coming from Congress, he thought a large amount of money would be directed toward communities like Plattsburgh. Do you think that 
money f from that uh, will be available for this program? Yeah, absolutely. We, we think, and, and if I go back and, and remind you that we're, we're a private entity, so our, our business and our family is putting up the money to buy the dorms, and we're aligning ourselves with the actual agencies that will provide the services. We're not going to go out and actually ask for grants or money from the government. We're going to allow the agencies to do that because they're gonna facilitate the programs that are going on there. So ironically, it's probably the closest thing to a public-private partnership that I've ever been involved in. We're, you know, the, the, the pu there is going to be public money that's going to pay for some of this, but that will be administered by the agencies that are already administering it in different arenas. And when you talk about the clients who will be living here, the, the majority, current addicts and, and addicts in recovery? So the, the criteria is that it can't be so rigid that if you are trying to be in recovery and you relapse one time that you get thrown out. And there's some reasons for that. The goal for us is to provide a transitional living model for people who are sincere about trying to get better and are open to help to come there and for some period of time, whether it's a month, two months, six months, go from the place where they are not able to get a job and, and take care of themselves really to a place where they can go out into society and have the same American dream that you and I have. So the, the goal is really much more about taking people that really want to better themselves but don't know how to go about doing that and just need that help to get there. That's, that's really the goal. You believe this model can work? I, I would tell you that I, I believe this model can work from a, a large uh, platform. I've never actually seen all of the specifics of this work, but I have firsthand experience of helping people uh, do this. So in other words, we, I've never worked at a facility that had 20 beds and provided treatment and all that, but I have actual employees that still work for me who came from a place of having nothing and being homeless and having lost their kids and unemployable to becoming homeowners who raise their kids who help other people. So my practical experience in the last 30 years says we've done this with people, so we know it can work. Now we're just trying to magnify it by 100 or 1,000 times to be able to help the masses as opposed to just the individuals. And you talked about those employees at mm -hmm. your presentation where you helped them out and it made a world of difference and, and you use that if, as an example of mm -hmm. how we can help people in recovery and, and that it can make a big difference. Yeah, it's an interesting story and, and you know, I won't use their names and you know, for a lot of reasons, but they're, they're two wonderful people who got caught up in the meth business and, and back when meth was really big and, and they were facing lengthy prison terms and uh, the, the wife had, it was a little easier on her, uh, but the husband was facing, I think, seven to 20 years in federal prison for interstate trafficking of methamphetamine. And I wrote a letter on his behalf to the lawyer, and then I actually went to federal court in Utica on his sentencing day with his family, and uh, we all stood up and said, this is a good risk. We think that you should take a risk on this guy. Give him very strict probation guidelines, make sure he adheres to all the things that he's supposed to do, but putting him in jail doesn't benefit anybody, not him, not his family, and not society and the judge elected to take that opportunity to say I'm going to give you a chance and uh, and these two people have continued to work for me for five years they have their kids back uh, she is off probation he will be off very shortly they own a home in the city of Plattsburgh so they're taxpayers and they help other people now who are in some of the same situations that they were it's a heartfelt story it, it it's just a heartfelt story. And oftentimes, those folks can face hurdles and obstacles, and one of the biggest ones may be the stigma that's still out there in, in, in the community, and you talk about this a lot when it comes to addiction and recovery. Yeah, I think that, you know, for me, I, I don't wanna necessarily be the public poster child for what recovery is or what recovery isn't, but I do understand that if all that general society, non-recovering or people who are not or haven't been really personally afflicted by this, if all they see are the arrests of people and all of the bad news that goes with addiction, they never understand that people can get into recovery, change their life, and become different people. And so what we're trying to do is to get people to understand that that can actually happen. And if, if people like me, who I guess have a, a bit of a public voice and a little bit of an ability to do it, aren't willing to stand up, then I can't expect the stigma to go away and I can't expect the other people to stand up and do it. So we, we absolutely do have to. You know, I kind of, I become very impassioned by this when people ask me this question. If all we're gonna do is throw addicts into a jail cell and say, you can just stay there for the rest of your life, that's one thing. 
But if we're actually going to try to reacclimate them to society, but society isn't going to embrace them, it's kind of counterproductive. And so we're really trying to get that eradicated as much as possible. And it's not without its challenges. We, I, you know, if you think about the life of an addict, I never intentionally hurt anybody in my life, Tom. It wasn't my goal. I never wanted to do that. But when you're in active addiction, you're going to do whatever you have to do to be able to maintain that. And that becomes very frustrating for our loved ones and the people who watch this go on for years and years and years. So I understand where the stigma comes from and where the, the judgment of, of that person comes from. And what we're asking is for people to really understand that this is an illness and, and most of the stuff that's done by people in active addiction really is done under duress and under the guise of I, I need to be able to get high and it doesn't really matter who I hurt along the way to get there.